Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Bell. Today we're joined by Heather Cates and Andrea Mason to talk about MTSS, the framework that we use to support our students in the classroom. We're so glad that you guys could join us this morning. Um, Andrea, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Andrea Mason. I am the academic interventionist at County Line Elementary. Um, I started teaching in 2000, um, and I've been at County Line my entire career. Um, I taught kindergarten and first grade um, before I moved into the academic intervention position. Hi, my name is Heather Cates, and I'm currently the MTSS coordinator for Barrow County School System. And before this, this is my second year in that role, and before that I was a school psychologist um, in some neighboring counties and in Barrow County uh, for several years. So I have over a decade of experience doing that type of work. How did you make the jump from school psychologist to working at MTSS? Well, I think um, in school psychology, a lot of what we're doing is evaluating students to determine if there is evidence of a disability that's impacting them in the school setting. And after doing that for a number of years, I started to really ask a lot of questions and become curious about, well, what's happening before a student is evaluated? Um, and so that's kind of how I became interested in um, really thinking about the interventions that we're providing and the type of instruction that we're providing to students on a daily basis. What is MTSS, what does it stand for, and why is that so important to go ahead and having in Barrow County School System? So MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered System of Supports. And it's really the framework for how we support students of varying needs um, in our county and in systems across the state and country. Um, so here in Barrow County, we are in our second year of implementing this system of supports, and we're really trying to think about what the services and supports are at each tier, each level, and there are three tiers in an MTSS system. Uh, what are those three tiers? So tier one is kind of the universal tier. So that's what um, the core curriculums and standard-based instruction that we provide to all students. Tier two is for students who maybe need some more time, more intervention, more support in a smaller group setting. So we call that like targeted group instruction. And that can be for behavior, it could be for academic needs, it could be for both. And then tier three is our most intensive level of support and that's where we're individualizing the support for the students um, and providing that at a more intense level. Okay, so how is MTSS different from the traditional approach of student support? I think MTSS is really at its heart we're trying to be preventative. So it's based on a public health model public health science, that we are focusing our efforts more on prevention because that's how we're going to affect the biggest change for students and help the most students. Um, so in that way, we're not being reactive. We're trying to be proactive. And we're trying to build a nice continuum that supports a variety of student needs. So what I take from this is it's, you're going ahead and getting ahead of the grain of making sure that these students are taken care of before you even know if there's something that they need. You're... Exactly. Okay. And we're kind of, you know, I like to think about it with that medical model a little bit of like when you go to the doctor, they are screening, you know, your blood pressure. And that's one thing that they're trying to check to get ahead um, to know where you stand there. And so similarly, in education now, we are doing screening multiple times a year with our students. So we're making sure that we're identifying students who might be at risk of having difficulty. Okay. I think also um, something that I see that is a lot different than when I first started teaching, um, a lot of the intervention type things fell on the classroom teacher. And so as a classroom teacher, I was teaching my students. And then when I had a student that was struggling, it was on me 
to um, figure out what interventions to do, to find the time. And so now the way that we're approaching it in the county is we have a lot uh, more support in place. And so we have in our schools, we have our EIP, early intervention teachers, that are helping with interventions. Um, my position was created, academic interventionist. And so I can come in and help with interventions. And so we have a lot more support in place for these students rather than it all just falling on the classroom teacher. And so we're able to um, not only be more proactive, but then when we have a student that's receiving intervention, we're able to do it with fidelity and the student is able to receive intervention as often as possible um, because we have so many people in place. So uh, can you walk me through what a daily basis looks like for your position, an academic interventionalist? Mm -hmm. um, so in my position, um, and in, in the different schools in the county, um, the academic interventionist, their day might look a little different just depending on the needs of the students in that building. But um, at my school, um, I predominantly work with students who are in the Tier 3 um, process of, of MTSS. So these are the students who um, had some struggles at tier one with the, the regular classroom um, teaching. And so they moved into tier two where they received some small group support and extra intervention. And then they were still having some difficulty. Um, and so then when we move them into tier three, um, they are either they're going to receive more intervention support during the week, um, either more sessions of intervention, or instead of a small group of maybe five or six, they are receiving intervention in maybe a group of two or three, or even independent by themselves, depending on the needs. Um, and so what I do during the day is I spend time either pulling small groups or one or two students um, to work on whatever their intervention is. So if it's um, reading comprehension is the area that they're working on, then I'm using um, interventions that are aligned to what they need. And then I also spend time, um, like Heather mentioned, how we screen our students. Um, so we do universal screeners three times a year, but then I have other screeners that I can use, um, phonics screeners or phonemic awareness where um, we can see on the universal screener, maybe this student is having some difficulty, then I can use um, a, a more specific screener that can dig down into those skills and show us exactly where the deficits are. And so um, some of my day might be pulling students to assess, um, pulling students to do what we call progress monitoring, where we're doing a, a check-in to see, are the interventions working? Um, and so we do progress monitoring to see if those skills are improving. Um, and so part of my day is spent doing that. And then I also work with teachers if they have students that um, they need some extra ideas on what to try um, at the tier one level, then I can sit down with those teachers and give them some um, support and guidance on what they could try at the tier one level um, if a student is starting to show some difficulty. So I'm, I'm all over the building. I, I do a lot of different things um, with the intervention program. So what role does data play in the MTSS framework? So a very important role. We really want our decisions um, within that multi-tiered system of supports to be made on what the data is telling us. So asking good questions about that data and making sure we're getting the most valid and reliable data that we can. And I mentioned progress monitoring. So that's a big piece of data for MTSS when a child is in the MTSS process and they're receiving interventions, um, we don't wanna just continue interventions that may not be working. Um, and so we progress monitor. So if a student is working on decoding skills, which is being able to sound out words, and um, we have certain interventions that we're doing with that student, then every two weeks or so, we're gonna do a check-in with a progress monitoring and see um, if this is working. And then over time, we can see, okay, what we're doing is working, let's continue, or this is not working for the student. We need to revisit and see what to do differently. Um, so that data that comes from the progress monitoring is, is so important um, in order to make sure we're on the right track because every student has different needs. Um, and so it's very important that, that we're looking at that progress monitoring data very regularly to see if we need to adjust anything. What is science of reading? Uh, the science of reading is, um, the body of research 
that um, tells us how the brain learns to read. Um, it is based on not just educational research, but neuroscience, um, psychological research. And so we've learned how the brain learns to read. And so under the science of reading, we have different um, techniques, um, different strategies that fall in line with how the brain learns to read. Um, and so it's not, science of reading is not a curriculum or um, a set of lessons. It is the research that then curriculum is based on. Okay. So when did, when did, when did this research come out? When did we learn how people read? Well, actually, this research started um, decades ago. Okay. Um, there's even, I've even read um, some things that were being done in the 1950s and 1960s um, where they were, scientists were starting to um, do research on how the brain, um, what happens in the brain, you know, when a child is learning to read. Um, and they've done a lot of um, research with MRI, having people under MRI while they're reading, and they can look and see what, what parts of the brain are firing um, during different parts of reading. And so... Um, this actually did, like I said, started decades, decades ago. Um, but it has just recently, in the last few years, really come to the forefront um, in education. And um, so that's why a lot of changes have been made um, in the way that we're teaching reading, because we're now looking at that research that has been around, um, and we're seeing how following that research is um, so much more effective than some of the ways that we were teaching before. So how does the science of reading fit into that MTSS model? Well, now that we have all this research, and like Andrea was saying, it's really coming to the forefront of education. Um, states all over the country are passing laws similar to the ones that Georgia has passed, which is the early literacy law and what's known as the dyslexia law which is basically requiring education systems, local education agencies, school districts, to use the science of reading and make sure we're aligning our curriculums and interventions to that science, what that research is telling us, which is how best to teach children how to read. Especially with the MTSS model and the types of interventions that we're using, um, it used to be um, that teachers would just pull, you know, whatever activities that they thought would be helpful for the student, um, and there wasn't a whole lot of rhyme or reason. Um, but now we we're, we've worked on compiling interventions that align to the the science of reading, and so now when we are choosing interventions to um, use with a student, we know that what we're using is based by, uh, it's backed by research. Um, there's evidence behind it to show that, that it is the appropriate way to teach. Um, and so I think by making sure that our interventions are aligned with the science of reading, um, then we know that it's, it's going to be more successful than what we've done in the past where we just kind of grabbed whatever, whatever interventions we had at the time that we thought would work. And the science of reading, that starts, like, you guys have started that tier one, like, the teachers teach that in the classroom. It's not just for the students that need tier two or tier three. Yes, correct? that's correct. In fact, part of the early literacy law that Georgia passed was is requiring all school districts to have a high-quality tier one curriculum. So, um, and this law went in, is going into effect this school year. Um, so there have been several years of preparing and um, you know, pilot districts, but this year it has gone into effect and in preparation, Barrow County, um, through their instructional council, chose a high quality tier one curriculum and are implementing that this year. So it's a new ELA curriculum for our K through fifth graders. So what is early literacy law and dyslexia law? We're going to go back to that because you did mention it a few questions before. Yeah, so these are two laws that the Georgia legislature passed actually in 2019, I believe, that take effect this school year. And so the early literacy law is really um, the law that specifies school how school districts teach reading. 
Okay, and so making sure that we are using a high quality curriculum from a state approved list um, with our K through three third graders um, with those grades and also that we are doing that regular screening. That's part of that MTSS system, mm -hmm. um, which is that universal screening um, three times a year in reading to check and make sure um, that we are being effective, and if we're not, that we do something about it. So that's kind of the early literacy law. The dyslexia law is really making sure that we are also screening students once a year in grades kindergarten through third grade for characteristics of dyslexia to determine if they are at risk. And if they are, that we are making sure we're providing um, appropriate support and intervention to those students. Um, what time of the day do you usually do that? At the beginning of each school year? And Actually in the middle. In the we middle. are gonna, yes, it's recommended that you do that in your middle of the year screening, um, especially for our, because beginning of year screening, especially for kindergartners, it's too you early. know, yeah, is a little too early. So do you do that for all grade levels or what's? The law requires that it's done for kindergarten, first, second, and third. Kindergarten, first, second, third. Yes. Okay. So that's what we are doing um, this year. We are expanding our universal reading screening for fourth and fifth graders this year. So we'll be screening um, students to see if they are at risk of reading deficiencies uh, K through fifth. Okay, but these two laws, they go hand in hand, how I take it? Yes, that's okay. exactly right. Yes, they do. And the, the state is also requiring us to, um, to keep more, I guess, paperwork on students. So if we have students that the screening is showing um, that they are having um, difficulties in a certain area, then we're required to have a reading plan to show you know, this is where the student is struggling, and then this is what we're doing. Um, and so it's it's a way for the state to, to make sure that we are complying, but it's also a very good practice because then we have, you know, something written saying, this is what's going on, this is what we're doing to fix it, um, and then, you know, parents are able to see specifically what we're doing. Um, and so I think it gives them peace of mind that, you know, we're putting everything in place that we possibly can to help their student. Um, so it just kind of makes um, what we've done for a while more official. Another important piece of the early literacy law is the training for teachers. So we are required to train all of our K through five or K through third grade, but we are doing K through five teachers in science of reading and best practice for reading instruction. Do you do that on PL days or like... What's the process it's, for that? It's a long process. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's broken up, I think, over about a year mm -hmm. through these uh, virtual modules that teachers are going through, and then we are getting together on PL days mm -hmm. to discuss and break down what we've learned. Mm -hmm. There are 10 uh, modules in, in the um, Georgia Literacy Academy is what it's called. Um, and so we have, like she had said, we are training K through five, even it, well, pre K actually it, uh, are also required. Um, and our specials areas teachers, our counselor, everyone in the building basically, it, para pros, anyone who is working with students um, is going through and, and um, completing those 10 modules. And it starts with um, phonemic awareness and teaching kids to decode, and it moves into teaching about. Um, how to work with vocabulary and how to work with comprehension. And so it goes through um, all areas of reading. And so it's giving our teachers um, background knowledge on how to teach these different things, but it's also helping to equip teachers with the knowledge of um, if my student is struggling with this, then this is what I need to do next, or um, these are strategies that I can try. So it's I know we use that word empowering pretty often, but it is empowering teachers with the knowledge on how to recognize reading issues and then um, what to pull from in order to address that reading issue. Okay, so you said it's 10 modules. Do they have to do this like every so many years or one time you do it, you're good, and then if you're a new teacher, do your 10 modules? Like what's the process with that? 
That's a good question. I think, you know, once you go through it, you've kind of gone through it. It's, mm -hmm. So it's not something that you have to redo. Okay. Um, but for like a new teacher coming in, it would be something that they would need to go through unless they have completed that somewhere else. Okay. So there are certain, you know, exceptions or things that would work and qualify as that training. But um, the law is requiring that all of our teachers across the state be trained. When I started my research, I found it very fascinating that um, our brains are actually not wired to to read, to read, to learn to read. Um, when we're babies and toddlers, we learn to speak just from listening to people around us talking. So our brains are wired for speech, to learn to speak, excuse me, to learn to speak. But to learn to read, um, it's not a natural process. And so when Heather was talking about the code, we have to explicitly teach children how to, what we call, crack that code. Um, so we have to teach them about letters and sounds and how they go together to make words. Um, there was a time in education where we thought that reading was just a natural um, thing like speaking. And so we would say, let's surround our kids with lots of books, lots of um, literacy, literacy rich environments, and they would just pick it up. And that actually is not true. Um, we need to teach our kids explicitly how to read. Now, some children will learn to read with very little um, instruction. And then some students are going to need a lot more um, and a lot more repetition. But the younger they are when we um, pick up on any difficulties, the younger they are, um, the better chance they have of being able to catch up. Um, research shows that if a student is not reading proficiently by fourth grade, um, then it's, it's almost impossible to get them caught up. And so that's why we really want to hit these um, reading difficulties as early as we possibly can um, so that we can give them the best chance of becoming proficient readers before um, they hit that point where it's harder to get the brain to grab onto that information. Absolutely. Yeah. And kids can, and, you know, people can always learn how to read. Even, you know, students or people with dyslexia, characteristics of dyslexia, can learn how to read. It's just that after that certain age and point, it takes a lot more time and intervention um, and is a, a harder, longer process. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of advice would you give parents that want to help their students like outside of the classroom, like at home with that reading? Um, I think what's really important for parents to understand is before a child is learning how to read, where they're actually seeing words on the paper, um, we really need to develop what we call their phonological awareness or their phonemic awareness. And that is their ability to hear sounds, be able to produce sounds, and what we call manipulate sounds. Um, so that can be with your children just um, playing little rhyming word games out loud. Um, or when you're driving in the car and you say, um, oh, you know, I see a light. What sound do you hear at the beginning of light? And the child, you know, ul. So being able to isolate that sound and hear, okay, light begins with ul. Um, and so I explained to parents that you, you don't have to have um, expensive resources in the house. Um, you know, reading books to your child is absolutely one of the best ways um, to help them develop that, that oral language. Um, but a lot of students, even older students that struggle with reading, they have a deficiency in their phonemic awareness or their, their oral language skills. So we may have fourth and fifth graders that are struggling to read, and then when I sit down and work with them, and I say, you know, do these words rhyme? Red, bed. They can't even recognize that they rhyme because they don't have that ability to hear the similarity in those two sounds. And so I always tell parents to spend time, especially with their younger kids and even, you know, toddlers, it is a great time during toddlerhood to work on this, but just exploring language, oral language, talking about what words sound the same, or, you know, I see a ball that starts with buh. Can you find something else in the house that starts with buh? And they can do all of this without even knowing the names of any letters. Um, but that is, it, it is the building block to being able to read is that what we call phonemic awareness. And so I think anything that you can do 
with your child um, just to enrich that oral language. Um, having conversation with your with your child if you're cooking dinner, talking about what you're doing. Okay, now mom is gonna cut up these carrots. K -k carrots. And so it sounds so simple, but it is so impactful. Um, and so then when they come to us in pre-K and in kindergarten, if they have that strong um, foundation of phonemic awareness, they're going to most likely um, pick up on those reading skills uh, uh, with a lot less effort um, because their brain already, like when we're teaching the letter B, well, if they are already familiar with the B sound, that's not a new sound for them, then they can connect the sound B to the written letter yeah. B so much more faster than if they don't really have exposure to the oral sound. You know, also when your children are young, you want to um, highlight, you know, good articulation of words. And if your child does have some articulation errors, especially when they're about to go to school, so more that pre-K, because when they're little, that's very normal and developmentally appropriate. But as they approach that four-year-old, five-year-old age, you want to, um, if they still have a lot of articulation errors, you might want to look into correcting those. Um, if you need some help with that, you know, through a speech language pathologist or therapist so that that is developing accurate sound awareness and that phonemic awareness like Andrew is talking about, um, which will really prepare them for kindergarten and learning how to pair the sounds then with the letters correctly. Mm. I think that's all really great advice, especially like you said, start doing this with your toddlers before you even, they even get into school. It's going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, music, music, nursery rhymes, yes. reading to them are all great ways to develop that um, phonemic awareness. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. So we talked about the two mm -hmm. laws. They're specifically for reading. MTSS, is that for all subjects or is it just for reading? Will you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so MTSS is for the whole child. So that system of supports that we are trying to build and strengthen is for you know, a child's well, emotional well-being. It's also for math. So we do universal screening in math. So if a student is at risk for difficulties in that area, they are also able to receive you know, tier two or tier three support in math. Um, and Social emotionally, we have we're building capacity for our small group interventions like counseling groups and mental health support. So MTSS is designed to support the whole child. How can families be involved in the MTSS process? Um, so when our students are screened, um, parents are given results of those screeners. Um, we have um, reports that teachers will provide with parents. Um, and so that will let the parents know, you know, this is how your child performed on this screening. Um, either everything was great or we have some areas where we have a little bit of concern. Um, and so what I recommend to parents is when you receive those reports, if, if you have any questions about anything on there, normally the teacher is going to already um, have explained um, what the different things mean, but please reach out to your child's teacher if there's anything on there that's unclear or you're not sure about, or if you see an area where maybe the child didn't score so well and you would like to know, you know, what kinds of things the teacher has in mind to, to help that your child, please reach out. Um, we're here to to make sure that you understand everything that's going on with your child. Um, and we want you to also be a part of the decision-making process as well. So um, when a child moves into tier two or tier three, we always have the parents come in for meetings and to be part of the conversation about the interventions, um, about what is working, what is not working. So we invite parents to be an equal part of that process. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And, you know, if parents are aware that there is this tiered system of supports, then hopefully they feel more empowered to ask questions. And if their child is, you know, maybe struggling or, you know, that parent intuition that's telling them something is not right, you know, if they can reach out and ask, what are the other supports that are available um, for my student? I think that just helps us all work together on the same mm -hmm. team.
That was a deep dive into some of the tools that we use to support our students in the classroom. Make sure you stop by our website and our socials for more information. And remember, the learning journey never ends. It continues beyond the bell.